Hello and welcome to episode number 19 of Performing Labor. My name is Rob Simons, and I'm your host. This podcast features interviews with accomplished performing musicians who are doing interesting and creative work from within performing arts institutions and outside of them. We'll unpack their training, their practice, and their careers, how they got started, how they stay sharp, and their ambitions for the future. And it's my hope that these interviews will provide value no matter where you are on your musical journey. If you're thinking about a career in music, if you're in music school now, a working musician, or if you're a music lover and just curious to learn more. For this episode, I sat down with conductor, clarinetist, pianist, improviser, composer, and my former boss, Teddy Abrams, music director of the Louisville Orchestra and the Brit Festival in Oregon. This one runs a little longer than usual. This is not a change of direction or format for the podcast, but a reflection of the breadth of Teddy's range. I started this podcast precisely because I know lots of interesting people in this business, and none more so than Teddy. From both teachers and peers, we obviously learn concrete things that we can incorporate into our practice, but we also absorb undefined elements that we incorporate into our intuition. I got the whole spectrum from Teddy. New ways of thinking about objective music making, to more airy concepts, to how to think about the institution and what was possible. Whatever I say here in this intro, or what we get to in the interview, only scratches the surface. His work and accomplishments with the LO earned a spotlight feature from CBS Sunday Morning and a performance on The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon. The 2018 LO recording with Jim James earned positive reviews from major outlets, including Rolling Stone and Paste. The Associated Press said of it, quote, In their symbiotic relationship, James, who performs as both solo artist and leader of the rock band My Morning Jacket, has given Abrams and his orchestra an edge and lyrical depth. Abrams, meanwhile, has lent James a theatrical element, unmatched by anything he could have created on his own in a studio. In Louisville, Teddy has been an organizer. He's got his own annual stage time on Forecastle, the huge and eclectic summer music festival in Louisville, to play whatever and with whomever he wants. This year, for COVID relief, he brought Louisville's brightest musical lights together. He consistently uses the orchestra as what he describes in the interview as a platform to lift up ideas, innovation, and people. When things started to take off, and we were getting lots of local and national media attention. I had a line that I used in a few public statements about the orchestra. Teddy is the music director I've been waiting my whole career to play for. On one hand, it was just a catchy thing to say. But on the other, I meant something very specific by it. My first day of my first real orchestra job was the morning after 9-11. And not that long after, my orchestra at the time, sent me as a representative to the Mellon Foundation Orchestra Forum, which had seeded a group of orchestras with resources for innovation. The conference was a gathering of board, musician, and management representatives from around the country to report on their progress and exchange ideas. It was absolutely formative for me. The after effects of 9-11 and the dot-com bubble were still very much on everyone's mind. There was a high tolerance for reform and innovation, and how business thinking and a service mindset could be the industry's next evolution. There were a few isolated and pretty embarrassing moments when some folks dug in defending classical music status quo, but largely, great questions undergirded the meetings. How do we connect to the community in new ways? What is the role of the music director? How do we capture the creativity of the musicians? How do we cultivate a culture of growth and fulfillment? And on and on. All questions I have carried with me ever since. In the interview, Teddy and I touch on the Cleveland Orchestra as a representative of a certain conservative way of doing things. But at the Mellon Forum, I remember formal and informal conversations with Cleveland Orchestra representatives that laid out a very clear institutional purpose. It wasn't that they weren't innovating, but rather that they believed they could absolutely achieve 21st century goals within their model. A variation on that sentiment was published in Jim Collins' book, From Good to Great for the Social Sector, where he quotes former executive Tom Morris about the orchestra's decision to not change programming the week after 9-11. Quote, There is absolutely nothing that we could have done to be a better service at that moment than to stick with what we do best. 
standing firm behind our core values of great music delivered with uncompromising artistic excellence. My take is that I'm glad the Cleveland Orchestra exists. And if anyone can pull that off, over time, it's that group. But what does that mindset offer the majority of us in this business? The thing is, for as long as I've been in the business, we've been asking good questions and recognizing the limits of the status quo. But dynamic expectations continue to give way to a static reality. For better or for worse, our institutions still hinge on music directors, and we need them to fully participate. And Teddy was the first time I saw a forward-looking philosophy combined with action. He was willing to incur the costs that come with a different approach to both his career and institution building. The payoff, though, is an orchestra that routinely stretches itself, brings vivid experiences to its city, expands the community of active listeners, and plays a role in public life. Recently, I've been working my way through the books of John W. Garner, who was the Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare for Lyndon Johnson, the only Republican, actually, in Lyndon Johnson's cabinet. I can't recommend these books enough. They were written in the 1960s, and they feel shockingly relevant to American life now. In 1961, he wrote, In Excellence, Can We Be Equal and Excellent Too? Quote, High standards are not enough. There are kinds of excellence, very important kinds, that are not necessarily associated with the capacity for renewal. A society that has reached the heights of excellence may also be caught in the rigidities that will bring it down. An institution may hold itself to the highest standards and yet already be entombed in the complacency that will eventually spell its decline. Please enjoy this interview with Teddy Abrams. Teddy Abrams, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me. Great, great to be with you, Rob. Well, there's a million things, obviously, that I'd like to talk to you about. And uh, the trick of this will be to keep this compressed, if anything. Um, but I want to start with your early career and contrasting with my own. I'm about probably about 10 years your senior. And when I was a kid growing up in Massachusetts, I listened pretty broadly to music. I listened to a lot of classic rock in the background like progressive rock, folk music. I was obsessed with Dylan. I still am obsessed with Dylan, John Prine, a lot of progressive like Primus and uh, bands like that, kind of weirder the better. But the thing that I've reflected on a lot in my adult life and in my professional career is I never was able to synthesize those two things. They like, never connected somehow in my actual playing. I want to unpack a little bit about how you became so fluent and so immersed at a young age in different styles and how all those things connected for you? Well, I think the weird part of that story is that I didn't listen to that much music outside of classical music when I was growing up. And I don't talk about this a whole lot because I'm not proud of it, um, but I was your ultimate snob. Like I really, I, I, I was a very kind of odd kid, um, you know, in a lot of the sense, like the, the way you're nerdy, piano kids are lampoon now. I mean, like a, a Judd Apatow style, like really like that. <laughs> really a strange, <laughs> eccentric individual. And part of that package was the real, like singular track of, of taking classical music seriously, classical with a big C and, and lowercase c, mm -hmm. both classicals. And, uh, and, and by seriously, like that was, it was like a monastic kind of devotion to that. And I did not come from a family that, that really, you know, listened to broad ranges of music at home. We, my, my dad loved Oscar Peterson. I loved Oscar Peterson. Um, I, I loved most music that I heard. That was the funny thing. Like when I heard stuff in, in any popular genre, I, I like it, but verbally and, and intellectually, I, I had this like militant stance about the kind of, you know, sense of the superiority of this music that I was devoted to. And it, I don't know where the hell that came from. Mm -hmm. It's weird, but I think, it, you know, it came from probably at a, 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 an OCD element of my life, um, you know, which hopefully, well, thankfully has been transferred into other things. But, but back then it was like this, you know, weird, weird dynamic that, that uh, was expressed in many different ways, including 
you know, I, I, because I didn't connect with other kids my own age, I felt almost a personal relationship with the, you know, Pantheon com mm -hmm. composers list of Mozart and Beethoven. Like they were people that I related to. They were stories. I mean, I, 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 I read everything that I could about these composers' lives because I felt like I understood where they were coming from. That, those were my people. Those were my, those were my friends. Sadly, I didn't, I didn't connect with people my own age for a long time. But the one thing I had going for me because I don't consider, I, I'm not proud of that, as I said, but, but I'm also, I'm not embarrassed of it because that's just who, who I was then. It didn't come from like some weird uh, supremacist background. Mm. It's just, that's what I knew. And I loved that music. And I, and I played it hour after hour after hour a day. And um, I wasn't immersed in a lot of other things. But the one, as I said, one thing I had going for me is the improvisatory technique that I don't know where that came from because I didn't know the historical significance of improvising, but I did love to improvise. So I didn't know um, uh, the, the, the importance that it had in Bach and Mozart and, and Beethoven's lives. I knew that they had done it and I thought that was kind of a curiosity, but I didn't, I didn't yet understand the improvisatory fluency leads to compositional fluency, which I, I believe now. I believe that, that the relationship of improvising to composing is just like speaking to writing. You know, you can, they're, they're very closely connected together. They, came from the same, same, they come from the same generative force. So that was the thing that led to my, my awakening. And that, was, that, that, that took a long time. Um, it, but it, it was probably my late teens and early twenties when I started really listening to a, a lot of other music and, and, and recognizing that the same forces that drove the classical music that I loved operated in all these different ways. You know, there was like a, you know, a God by many names and, and I, I didn't need to be a crazy, you know, Agnes, whatever, <laughs> like crazy, you know, militant, uh, 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 you know, religious type with, with classical music. And, and that's when I, I started realizing, like, it was okay to listen to a pop song and you don't have to be secretly uh, enamored with it. You can accept that there is power in that and that, that broadened up. And, and then when I recognized the differences in the actual world of, of the way they operate, you know, versus the way the classical music operate, I became to really detest what our <laughs> industry has become and, and, and really, you know, the business side and the operations side, I, I realized just how wrong we have it, that they've, they've been far more right about most things. What kind of style would you describe your, your early improvisation? Were you improvising in a way that you imagined Bach might have improvised or was it kind of drawing on other sources? I think it drew on a lot of other sources, even though, I mean, I wasn't a jazz pianist back then. I hadn't, I hadn't learned jazz. I hadn't played in that, that style. Yet, if you ask me who, who, who I wanted to write like, I would always say Gershwin. Mm. And that really is only, I, I only ever knew one kind of version of Gershwin that came from the first classical concert that I heard, the first uh, orchestral concert, I guess you could say, when I was nine. That was an all Gershwin show. I never, I didn't know who Gershwin was going into that. Man, I heard the Rhapsody in Blue. But as I said, I didn't come from a, a background where we'd all, you know, hover around the, the Victrola, like some classic, <laughs> you know, like American family, <laughs> and, and listen to the Met Opera broadcasts every weekend and, and you know, go to, go to jazz clubs and things like that. That wasn't my, my background. Um, and, and so when I started re realizing, why, why do I like Gershwin so much? Like, why do I like that? Why, do, why was my favorite clarinet piece the Copeland Concerto? What, what was it about that? That's when I started to really understand, okay, there's something deeper here um, and obviously having MTT as a mentor, you know, his whole approach was in, in, in bringing these composers who had had a deep root in, in folk music or popular music and, 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 and understanding the significance of that connection to people. That, that helped a huge amount. So without an adult figure in your family that reinforced this curiosity of yours? I went to school, I was in a very small school for a lot of years in my high school age and middle school age. And I went to school with a lot of very, very bright people, and some of whom expressed a certain eccentricity as well. <laughs> and, but there was like a reinforcing factor. I don't doubt their sincerity, nor that I doubt your sincerity. But there was some reinforcement of the teachers in the school that really kind of fed that. So was MTT the first person to say this is something that you shouldn't be ashamed of and say, take this as far as you can take it? 
I, I think it was through the lens of, of MTT because it was because of him that I that I started learning about composers like Ives, Gershwin, Copland, you know, the, the, the also the, the Russian folk style composers, you know, early Stravinsky. And whether it was the way he explained it or just something more natural in the way I understood that, there was something that I loved deeply about the source material of, of all of those composers. I, and I... I I recognized that I was connected to that story in a way that, that when it came to, to, to Mozart and Haydn, even though yeah, they, they do draw on those same elements, there is that same you know, dynamic between the music of the people and the music that they wrote, it wasn't as pronounced. And I was deeply drawn to that, that you know, side of it where composers were explicit in connecting with you know the the the, the music that they would have experienced and you know when you when you grow up around mtt and you hear from him why Mahler sounds the way that it does and you spend a year working on appalachian spring with him i mean there you you start to understand um just by osmosis and by you know his genius and insights into this um that deep sense of 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 source and 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 meaning and subtext like he was big on on the subtext of this music and the subtext isn't just kind of what the piece is about it's deeper than that it's the why ives would choose these seven you know um uh northeastern uh, hymns that they get included in, in in a piece and are transformed in this way it's what that would have meant to the people that were listening to it back then and that asking of why 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 is it there because when you go through that lens, you start listening to that music and, and you start loving it as the source material. Um, I remember when I was, when I was first learning um, Firebird, I was a kid and I, I found this, this version, is, it was very hard to find back then, now you can, now you can get it easier, um, of a p solo piano version of the Firebird. And, and I remember, I wanted to say, okay, so what, where, where are these weird sounds coming from? I know they're not, they're not really weird to, to us, but to me, who grew up on the strict diet of Bach, Mozart, Beethoven, I was so, I, I was enamored with everything. So I started reading, you know, Richard Truskin's books about the source material and everything that Stravinsky wrote. And, and I, as soon as I started listening to what that Russian folk music sounded like, I couldn't get that out of my head. And that, by extension, led to this broadening of, of my understanding of, you know where our music really comes from, and I realized that the 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 story that we're being told as young classical musicians is not true. It's we 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 have this I, I call it the you know the Athena complex where we we tell everybody that they just sprung right out of fully formed. You know, there's no bad there's a, there's no bad Mozart. There's no bad Brahms. You know, never mind he burned the bad Brahms, but like the, this idea that these people were such geniuses that it would have been that way in they're, they're not connected to the stories of real music of, of human beings that, that that's been made and produced by by people who who will never be known. That's the that's the source material that, that drove it. So anyway. Long way of saying it, it was a slow build, but but I, I came to love those styles of music and just become totally attracted to it in in a way that that I don't know I don't know how else it would have would have happened. So kind of getting to the source of the humanity of these folks led you to a broader diet of music. But as you got a little older and you started incorporating this into your own practice, I'm assuming. So you said you weren't a jazz pianist at that time. So how did you become a jazz pianist? How did you become a clarinet player with more influences? So, I mean, I think there were, there were a couple of different forces at play. One was this internal struggle with contemporary music because what my clarinet teacher growing up was in an all contemporary woodwind quintet. I would go to see these crazy concerts out in San Francisco. You know, I, I remember one of the first concerts that, that I went to was like something out of an SNL sketch. Uh, I, I was eight years old, just starting to study with this guy who, by the way, is an amazing man, we, uh, went on to found Blue Bottle Coffee. He, he is the sole owner of Blue Bottle oh Coffee. So incredible story. He was obsessed with coffee, obsessed with the clarinet. That was, was my clarinet teacher. That was all he was doing back then. There was no, he was just roasting coffee for fun. Um, and, uh, anyway, he, he invited us to a concert in the mission back when the mission was a gritty part of San Francisco, not that, you know, Google employees hang out, not their little playground, but, but there's like, you know, really had to, as an eight year old walking around at 10 at night in the mission, that wasn't just what you did. So we went and, and my parents took me, they all dressed up to go to this concert. And I remember the first piece of music was a 12 minute piece where this, clarinet player started playing all squeaks and squawks and eventually went through about 20 or 30 reeds stomping on them on the ground up and down and screaming and yelling 
and like like just like a parody, like a parody of these things uh, at the end of having broken and destroyed reeds and thrown them around the room, took a bow and everybody clapped, all, of course, all wearing black in a black box theater. It was, and this was, so I, I got this introduction to that world of like really, you know, out there, avant-garde avant music. And I loved the idea of loving it, but I didn't like it. I didn't want to write like that. I couldn't find in me the way of justifying what I believed I wanted to write as a musician and what I thought was good music with this, this understanding that that was, you know, important and, and that was a practice that it was, you know, you know a, a, a hard edged thing that you had to do to prove yourself. And I guess this is, a, this is a long way of saying, I had this realization early on when I was looking at Copeland's story. And, and when, I, when I learned this, this whole thing about Aaron Copeland was writing relatively avant-garde music for the time, um, back in the, in the 1920s and early 30s. And, you know, just to summarize it kind of grossly, but, but you know, he had this realization that people weren't really getting it on a broad platform. They, he was appreciated and the music was great, but the average American wasn't going to listen to, um, you know, music for the theater, which I love. It's a wonderful piece of the, or the organ symphony and pieces like that, symphonic ode. And we're going to listen to that and go, yeah, this is my music. You're, you're, you know, your your person in, in, in the middle of Montana wasn't going to say that they own that music. And he had that famous epiphany of, if you wanted to write music that, that, that every American could own, then he'd have to incorporate Americana directly into it in an honest way. And that had a huge impact on me. Um, and that was around the time that I was really studying Copeland with, with MTT. I was 14. It was the first time I was conducting Appalachian Spring. We did it for about a year. Um, so that storyline goes into this moment when I went to Curtis and my teacher there was a guy named Ford Lollerstead. Uh, he wasn't supposed to be my real teacher, but I kind of adopted him as my teacher and mentor. Uh, and he taught counterpoint and uh, advanced score study, advanced um, piano score playing. So like you, you, you these very, very advanced courses for composers and conductors. But his entire approach was that everything had to be improvised. So counterpoint was done uh, at the piano. He would, you, he would play a cantus firmus, which you had to memorize, and then he'd say, do a, a, a three plus four combined uh, species counterpoint. You have to improvise it. You'd play right there. You could not write it down and do a paint by numbers style. And he said, this is the generative force of all music, this ability to improvise contrapuntally. Like this is what you're doing is like speaking with proper grammar and speaking in proper clauses. That's what you do. We, we, our brain is capable of doing it. And that improvisatory technique was, was where I started realizing it's the same thing that drives a great jazz improv that drove, you know, the, the energy behind a, a Beethoven piano sonata is from this source. And that was around a time, you know, it was a long story, but a lot of my friends at Curtis, the most interesting and creative people, I was shocked. They weren't the orthodox classical people. You know, one of my best friends, this pianist, Roman Rabinovich, was, was improv, we, we do improv offs. We just sit there and play improv back and forth. Uh, Johannes Dickbauer, this, this crazy Austrian violinist, was like one of the most talented jazz improvisers ever. Right? The, the guy who lived two floors up from me, a bass player, Curtis, uh, now is the bass player of the Punch Brothers. Uh, my, you know, one of my, my closest friends, Gabe Globus Honig, this, this drummer who lived across from me, was like the anti-classical person. He was like, the I call him the Loki of Curtis. He'd sit around like trying to find any way of needling and, 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 and kind of like breaking down the systems. And, and he made me listen to so much stuff. And I realized all the barriers and the walls started coming down. I realized that all this stuff was just artifice. I put that up. Um, and, and that's when I thought, oh my God, I love this music. And I finally connected the dots. I thought, well, if you have some improvisatory technique and you have open ears and you love that music, you should be able to play it. You should be able to play it with respect, with respect, but you should be able to do it. And that's what I started saying. Okay, I love jazz. I love bluegrass. I love rock. I love this stuff. How can I play it? Let me use my ears. And I started just doing these straight up improvs at the piano over and over and over and over to learn the styles. And, and that's, that's what started it. During your time there, how much did you say you got out of this informal interaction versus the formal? I mean, was it like a 50-50 thing? Or is it, in retrospect, was your education really this kind of informal dynamic between you and your colleagues? Oh, it, it's absolutely that. That was what made Curtis great, was the think tank nature of it. Not Yes, the formal stuff was very important, um, but 
you know, and I say this with all due respect to Otto Werner Mueller, who was my actual conducting teacher, but everything that Otto Werner Mueller imparts, you can kind of sum up in your first week with him. You know, how to respect the score and study it, uh, you can learn that in a week. You, you, he can't study your scores for you. So mm -hmm. the idea of sitting around with somebody and doing score study for six hours a week is it's a nice concept, but it's not really helpful. In the end, somebody can walk you through their process of studying Petrushka, but if you're going to conduct Petrushka, you've got to spend 50, 60, 100, 200 hours studying it yourself. So uh, the stuff that I really took away from Curtis was this like collegial relational thing with, with other students who were brilliant. And, and I will say one of the best things about it, as a, I, as a conductor and pianist, I wasn't a, technically a piano student there, but I realized that there was a huge void in the need for pianists. There was a big gap because the piano students didn't want to play bassoon concertos mm -hmm. and accompany them and didn't want to go, you know, um, and, and, and do, uh, you know, an hour long oboe lesson and play random pieces of oboe literature, you know, so I did. So I would play for everybody's lessons and on their recitals. So I got to study with everybody. I played for gazillions of Pam Frank lessons and Ida Kavafian lessons and Dick Woodhams and Bernie Garfield and you name it, you know, Arnold Steinhardt over and over and over again. I got to play for the, some of the most incredible teachers on the planet. Gary Grafman, I was Yuja Wong's accompanist there because no other pianist was going to you know, show up and, and play the, you know, the orchestra part of the, of the rock modern up second concerto and so i got so much out of just building my own education there and um and putting together my own projects i really learned a lot about leadership from just you know i, I it sounds really stupid but i i love i was uh, the president of the student council there it's i mean it's like a dumb thing it's a school of 160 people i know this is really you know it's like being the president of the neighborhood association or something like that but it's but we we i learned so much about how to get stuff done by being the president of the student council and learning about, you know, everything from just smoozing with donors to raising money to, um, to actually having a plan and executing it outside of strictly music. Well, speaking of getting stuff done, so you brought a lot of this spirit of collaboration and American music and, and American vernacular music to the Louisville Orchestra, obviously. What would you say on a technical level as a class, what would a classical player get by studying jazz? Or studying other 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 genres, like what would it bring to their classical playing? Well, I think that the improvisatory fluency, more than anything stylistically, will have a huge impact on how they see music. Um, I mean, it, 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 it's not just improvisation, but it's composition. I think that that musicians should improvise and they should compose. I mean, even today in rehearsal, we were doing Vivaldi Four Seasons. And, and, you know, I know, I don't know how much people actually find this interesting, but I was talking a lot about, well, why does he bring this phrase in two beats early? Like, what would the music literally sound like if he just started it two beats later? And why did he choose to make this a three-bar phrase when it so obviously could have been the, 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 the simple version of a two-bar phrase? Like, you start thinking like that and stop treating, you know, music like the Bible and start treating it like your script that you own as, a, as an actor and asking why, why, why. I think Robert De Niro does that. I don't think that he worships every script that he gets so much that he barely can say the lines anymore. He owns his role. And when you improvise and you compose, you own everything. And that sense of ownership is, is something that's deeply instilled in that process. If you don't feel like you own your own improvisations and your own compositions, then what are you doing? You know, you're not, you're not just regurgitating stuff. Anyway, that is the, is something that we've lost so much in the way classical music is taught and practiced. Um, and it makes it no fun. That makes perfect sense. So let's connect that now to the orchestra. So these individuals working with that kind of framework and that kind of curiosity, how do we scale that up into the orchestra? And what does that mean? So when we say we brought in all these collaborative efforts, we got to see when I was there, we got to work with all these folks, kind of get to see their operational process. And I kind of have a sense of how it changed the DNA of the orchestra and, and what our priorities were. But I'd like to hear you kind of extrapolate on that a little bit. So we take these stylistic um, influences, and then we put it and we graft it onto an ensemble of 75 people. How does that work? Well, I mean, there are, there are more immediate uh, things that, that result from that mentality. And then there are goals and long-term things that I hope will, will result. I mean, one of the things is that I think our orchestra 
here, as you know, Rob, is, is one of the most open and welcoming to musicians of any style and background. Um, they are treated with respect, whether they've played a note with an orchestra or not, whether they read music or not. I think people here share, whether they articulate it this way or not, I don't know, but I think they share my sense that if somebody is a great artist and has a voice, they deserve to be able to work with us. We deserve to work with them. Yeah, I, I do not believe that experience with an orchestra or, or fluency with classical music has anything to do with the kind of work we should be encouraging and presenting. We should be finding the most interesting and creative artists, regardless of where they are, meet them where they are and use the orchestra as a platform to uh, build new dynamics and relationships and, and learn and actually learn and grow. That's not talked about at all in our world. We don't talk about learning because it's considered insulting and that is nonsense. No, we should all be learning and growing. The idea of pro professional development, which is a stupid, you know, institutionalized way of saying, continuing to grow and change. It was good enough for Stravinsky. It's good enough for us. And, you know, good enough for David Bowie. No, these people never stopped. And good enough for Beethoven, frankly. I know there's kind of a, a, a rant about this, but I will connect it back to, to, to what I think. For this concept to really take root and be successful long term, an orchestra is going to have to stop thinking of itself as a, a presenting organization for certain kind of repertoire with exceptions made. Stop thinking of that model and start thinking of it as, as a, an, an institutional platform for creative music making. I think that the amount of time that we spend on stage all together playing repertoire is way too much. We should be divided between doing that when it's the right time, the right thing to do, something really special that we have a real reason to say, and the other time, activating our individuality. That's the part that we don't get. We spend so much time doing groupthink that we, we forget to nurture the individual as a creative artist in an orchestra so that the individual members of the orchestra have only the groupthink to fall back on. Um, whereas, you know, if, if, if I could dream big here, all of that thinking about trying new things and improvising and composing, we'd actually be paying for that. We'd say, okay, come to us every year as an every individual member of the orchestra, tell us what you want to do for your six weeks of, of your own individual work, and then make us a little proposal. We'll fund that. You'll go do that. Just imagine how happy people would be if six or eight weeks out of every year, they were doing their project that they were passionate about. And we said, the only thing it has to be is you know, transformational in some way. It doesn't need to be jazz. It doesn't need to be bluegrass. It doesn't need to be a composition specifically, but it needs to be transformational to you and to the community. You tell us what you want to do, what aligns it. And then you combine that individuality with the group. Suddenly the group starts to, starts to seem really cool. But in no other profession of, of group activities um, is there such a strict concept of the group only. You know, there's, there, there, and we're, we're obsessed with that thinking on both sides, the musicians mm -hmm. and the, the management, so to speak. They're both of them because it's so much easier to, to, to do. It's so self-replicating every single year. It fits into a nice mold. Well, it's that, it's that contest between wicked and kind problems, right? So the, the kind problem, incredibly difficult to achieve, but definable. What I want to get at though is, so with, with this eclecticism, Clearly, we're shaking up the, the foundations of the thing. And part of the consequences of that is that we have more openness, for sure. Like, so the Louisville Orchestra is an incredibly elastic institution at this point. And almost nothing that comes on stage will phase the musicians. And conversely, very few things will shock an audience in terms of like, this is, this is insane. Like we can't, we're not even going to be open to this. Most people at this point are open to almost anything you put in front of them. So that's obviously a positive outcome. As we think about the, this sort of anodyne style of playing though, I think is what you're also getting at. And this, uh, you know, as the industry has become more professionalized over the past, let's say five decades or so, and the audition process has made the, um, the audition process all along the way, not just the entrance to the audition, uh, to the uh, orchestra, but to the conservatories and to get to the best teachers when you're in high school. I mean, it, it's an ongoing s series of evaluations that has pushed up the level of playing. The American orchestra, probably in particular, is more uniform. So do these different influences then get us back to a more, more regionalism in American orchestras and the, their way of playing and make them more immediately identifiable? That's, that's such an interesting question because it's, you know, you're seeing both things. In a certain way, 
um, because jobs are so scarce, the same talent pool is going to every single orchestra. Mm -hmm. So people will audition for the Louisville Orchestra that the next week uh, will audition for the New York Philharmonic because it doesn't matter. There are so many people vying for so few jobs that the talent pool goes to every single professional job because it's either that or nothing. That, that doesn't happen in almost any other profession. Mm -hmm. you, will, you will not have um, you know, somebody <laughs> at like a, a law firm going for a job that pays uh, $50,000 and a job that pays $300,000 in the same week. They will not. No other, it just the caste system doesn't work that way. But in ours, it's such a, you know, skewed market. Um, so that it does mean that every orchestra is kind of getting the same talent pool. Mm -hmm. You know, that same kind of, you know, New World Symphony style or somebody who's come from NRO, those kind of organizations, you know, which, which is an amazing thing. It means that, you know, as the Louisville Orchestra with our salaries, which I keep trying, you know, boost, and I wish were way higher, but we're getting incredible talent every single audition. So that does create a kind of um, homogenous quality to, to orchestras. But the, the, so for me, it's the talent that comes in the door is homogenous. It's not regionalized, but it's the, it's the, the mark of what our mission is that, that distinguishes us. I don't know about the sound itself, but I do know this. Orchestras aren't judged so much on their sound because we're not in competition, really. The number of human beings that put on two recordings back to back of two different orchestras and say, well, the Rochester Philharmonic sounds like this and the San Diego Symphony sounds like, those are like 10 people right now in the United mm -hmm. States that do that. And most musicians don't even do that. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, so, so what, that's not a game that we're playing. Maybe 50 years ago, there were a lot more people that would listen to Cleveland and Philly back, back and forth and debate the merits of the different interpretations. That's not a thing anymore. And if it is a thing, I'm not sure it should be a thing. It's fine if that's what you're, if that's what you want to do, but your average citizen of Louisville has no interest in having that conversation. And I'm interested in serving them. So for us, it's, it, we should be judged on, on the mission and the success in articulating that mission. To get back to what you were saying earlier, though, about why playing these different styles might be important, I was just on this neat call yesterday with the, uh, there's an advisory group for New Music USA, and one of the things that came up is how young composers these days have no genre allegiance. They will draw from anything. They'll they'll draw from dubstep and and from electronica and you know hip hop and bluegrass and uh, you know americana and old time and jazz and bebop and whatever they're they they are not beholden to these strict classifications that, that were very important because they were a form and i use this word you know it, it, thoughtfully they were a form of supremacy to have your genres and your classifications was literally class oriented mm -hmm. um and 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 race oriented many other things oriented but composers now aren't interested in those those definitions and labels and and for me who believes that the majority of music we play should be by living composers just like people experienced in Mozart's day, I believe we have the same rights as, as 18th century Vienna. Um, for somebody who believes that, if that's the truth, and most composers are drawing from lots of genres, to not be proficient in those genres as, at their roots means you're not set up to actually play that music. You're just gonna approximate it at best. So doing as, as authentically as possible and, and seriously studying what it means to play folk music and jazz and, and uh, rock well is actually best practice for being able to play living composers work because that's the influence that they're drawing on and that's their American right to do so. And if, you, and if you're an orchestra that's always said, well, we look down on that. We, we don't do that. That's not, you know, like learning bluegrass is not what, what our interest is. Then what happens when a composer, an American composer who you ought to be performing, who's drawing on that as an influence comes along and you've said, no, we don't play that style of music. We're not interested in even learning how to play that style of music. Then you can't play their music very well. I think what I'm getting at Rather than going back and fighting the battles of the 60s and say, whether well, you have the Chicago brass sound versus the Cleveland brass sound, something really, really hidden in the weeds like that. I'm actually thinking more like along the lines of what you said about ownership over your craft. And as, as orchestral musicians, all I can say with some, some firsthand experience, we're really looking to reclaim some ownership over our product and over our sound. And so rather than those kind of splitting hairs things, I'm actually thinking more about 
how these experiments into different genres might actually create more vivid and visceral performances of our standard repertoire. So rather than maybe these really subtle differences, are we actually playing this music in a way that vivifies it, if that's a, even a real word, but like revivifies it um, in a way that we've always talked about? Like we've always talked about making Brahms relevant or something, but is it actually possible for an American audience, at least in an American orchestra, to do that by combining um, styles, kind of the way I think I see this all embodied in you as a single interpretive artist. Yes, I, I believe that. I, I, and, but there are many things at play. And, and this, is a, this is a really fascinating question because it gets to the heart of recreative art, which is, is very, very important for the human condition. I mean, the idea of passing something down is essential to how human community is built. Um, whether it's in this very, you know, uh, broad sense or very specific sense. I mean, there's like, you know, your tribal storytelling or your, you know, your cultural, um, uh, you know. It's called cultural the, inheritance. Cultural inheritance, exactly. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's an identity situation or in the broad sense of saying, you know, across the board, Shakespeare and Beethoven are important. They, they belong to society at, at large and, and society deserves to have relationships with them. I believe in, in that. That's why I'm in this, this field. Like I do believe that, that there is this incredible role that we play in carrying on musical information, which encapsulates the, the human spirit from, and we, we've got about 600 years worth of it. That, that's, that's remarkable. You know, that, that does have like a monk like element to it that I, I believe in very, very deeply. And, and I also believe that when you play music in this, you know, when you play your own improvisatory or, or compositional music, there is a degree of saying, this I created, and I'm playing it in a way that, that, that well, connects with that fact that I created it, that we need to bring to the way we play almost all other music. Um, and that's what's lost so deeply, that that ability to put a Beethoven symphony there and just like a carpe diem kind of grab this thing and play it, whether or not it breaks rules or just say, this is my role, I own this thing. But how can you do that if you keep on reinforcing this orthodoxy, this sense of, of, of how this music is almost biblical in nature? Nobody, you can't even contend with it. You can't even understand it. You're not, you can't even begin to grasp the genius of the person that created it. If we keep reinforcing that, it will get us farther and farther from being able to play it. Mm -hmm. Like we just grabbed it and, 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 and ran with it. You know, like this is ours. We own this, this thing. And yes, we're still wrestling with it, but, but it, we, can, we can, you know, hold it. And that's, that's where I think my, my interest and love in the way I've, I've experienced, you know, folk music and, 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 you know, music of the people and, and, and improvisatory music ha has come to play in my own classical interpretations. Because I think when you play it like that, it does bring it alive. But that's only one part of it. You can't drop the context for how it's played. And I think that, the, you know, you could have the, you know, the greatest, most free, extraordinary performance, but if it's not contextualized for the audience at that time, then it won't matter. I think that, that how people experience this music and the way it's played have to go together. And I do think that there must have been an incredible energy to watching these orchestras contend with Haydn symphonies in London. But the fact that they were crammed into a room with 200 people or so in the audience and it was boiling hot and it was, you know, against every, every building code imaginable was part of that dynamic in the same way that I think people crammed into, you know, the, the, the clubs and bars of New Orleans and the teens had something to do with the experience. And we are so quick to write that off because we've moved everything into the temple that, it, that, that in the end, it makes it very hard to see the results of playing music in this way that is very dynamic, even when it happens. Does, have, does that kind of answer? You know what absolutely. I mean? Absolutely. No, I, absolutely. I had a coach in college, Alan Audi, who was uh, one of the percussionists in the percussion group Cincinnati, which was one of the most polished performing ensembles I've ever seen to, the, to date. And those guys were probably in their 50s when I was in school. Um, or at least Alan was probably in his 50s at that point. He had worked with Cage and all that stuff. I mean, he was a, really came out of the American avant-garde. And I think actually might have been in the Cleveland Orchestra for very briefly and said, I want out of this. But I, I remember very vividly, um, I was probably 19 or 20 years old at the time, and we were in some new music class. And he articulated what you're articulating. He's saying, how magical must it have been to have heard an orchestra struggle with Mahler the first time. And that's why I'm speaking in his voice now. That's why I liked to go hear student orchestras play it. 
rather than go hear the Cincinnati Symphony play Mahler as an example. And I remember thinking that was the most ridiculous thing I'd ever heard. <laughs> like as, a, as a, someone really struggling with the instrument and wanting to be perfect. I want to I wanna veer away just briefly on this topic, though, to a more mechanical issue, uh, process-oriented issue. So I'm going to say that I've never bought in to the the um, the monument type of comp- view of the composers. I I mean I get they, these guys are super bright. I get that they did some of and some of them are extraordinary extraordinary imaginations. But I I've never bought in in any kind of deep level to um, that this is the only kind of music that needs to be exalted. But I what I have been bought into is getting a job and getting through that really narrow bottleneck of the audition process. And so that as much as anything. Getting to the other side of that meant more to me than anything else. I, I look back at this, I, I cringe saying this, but I'll say it out loud. I remember thinking in my early 20s, like, I will have made it if my name is in the Ixom directory. Like, that's how I know that I did the thing I set out to do. In retrospect, now that I'm like in my mid-career, I'd love to see a way that we could fine tune that process, fine tune that audition process to make it more open to players with broader imaginations. So I remember something you said to me, and you went on a little rant in an audition we were sitting on together <laughs> about how psychologically deadening the audition process is. That, I, I, it's seared in my mind because it absolutely represents my own experience. Because I remember when I won my first job and I was in, going into the final round, I remember thinking, I've, I've won this. I finally have gotten through this process. I'm about to be offered a contract and I feel nothing. Like I felt no sense of elation, pride, accomplishment. I mean, I did eventually, and actually, be- actually becoming a good citizen of the orchestra gave me all those things, but that took a year or two in getting tenure and understanding how things worked. I'd love to hear just some broad, high-level thoughts on how we might start refining, like what kind of interventions can we make now to our audition process that might start feeding in these values into the way we hire yeah, that's, I mean, I think about this all the time and, you know, I kind of go back and forth between thinking that, you know, great ideas will change everything and the whole tear it down, start from scratch mentality. Because at its core, if you, if you really think back to the, the whole point of having these orchestras, it wasn't so that they could get together and, you know, play repertoire over and over and over again for people and concertize. Like the, the real concept of this had to be closer to the Upright Citizens Brigade. Like the whole idea of getting some really interesting musicians together that could create something bigger than themselves, right? Mm-hmm. And saying, well, if we got 50 really interesting musicians together, just imagine all the things that we could do, right? Think of all the sounds that we could make. I'm talking like deep in, in, the, in the philosophy of where this, this stuff even came from, you know? Because I don't think it came from, from some like, you know, Cajun style, well, what if we had 150 bongo players all playing at the same time? What if we, what if we just had 70 violins? What would that sound like? I don't think that's why we have orchestras. I think the idea of like almost Greek theater of saying, okay, we need these people to be there to create sounds that really give us perspective on the world. Well, let's go back to that. Who are the human beings that we want to represent what music means in our cities? Is our process right now for finding them aligning with that value? Now, I know that most people wouldn't say that that's the value system, but that's my value system. I think if a city's forking over $100 million a year to have this thing, then that should be the value proposition. You should be saying the point of having an orchestra in X city with two letters in it, because all the cities with two letters have the orchestras with, you know, know, SFLA, NY, whatever it is, (laughs) should have then the value proposition should be, these are the people that have been chosen to be the, the musical representatives of your town, to, to, to provide and promote what's best about music in this society right now, in this community right now, to be the creative artists that, that have been given the, the platform to share that, the Greek theater of today. What about our audition resembles that value system? Zero. Our system right now is geared towards free solo, the people crazy enough to climb up a mountain with no ropes. That's what our system does. Now, that, so, so we get these people that are able to, at 7.30 in the morning, go into a room with 12 other people, 15 other people that are all playing the same excerpt maddeningly, and then at 8.30 in the morning, go through 
15 seconds of, of each of the pieces that they've been asked about. What, what mentality are we testing there? We're te we, rather than testing people, they, they, they can, you know, dream up a topography and create, you know, a beautiful painting or, or, or something like that. We're testing the people that can just climb up the mountain to see. Now, sometimes, with, like in your case, Rob, we happen to be lucky enough that those things align. Somebody who, who is able to go through the trials and tribulations of Sarastro can actually also be the creative people you want in your organization. But, but we're getting those people by luck. We're not testing for that in the actual audition. We're get lucky enough when they happen to also have that sense of community and creativity and curiosity and education and growth and wanting these things, but we're not testing for that. We're just hoping that enough people who happen to have those characteristics can also go through the physical trials, which is mostly what they are, physical mm -hmm. trials. You know, the, 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 the free market has a way of doing that in the pop music world. The, uh, say what you want about it. Yes, there's a lot of crap that just, you know, gets, gets pushed to the top and that we buy and, you know, they sho shove down our throats. That's true. But there are also are so many remarkable human beings and artists that because we, we are attracted to them as human beings, we're attracted to, they can do something special. They are special. They, we want them. We want them in our lives and we listen to their music. We watch their movies. And, and our system doesn't really give us the tools to, 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 to find those, those people. Thank God so many of them also have the extreme physical resilience to make it through the audition process. Thank God, because they are out there. I'm not saying that they're not out there already in our orchestras. I'm just saying that we're not setting up a process to cultivate and find that and make it okay for those people to be themselves. This goes back again to the idea of like regionalism for me though, that this, so there's a, there's a chicken and the egg problem with, in my mind about this. So let's say, let's say you're the person that's totally bought in to the classical music paradigm as we have understood it like in the late 20th century. And yes, you will literally go to any audition anywhere because you want to make the music, you want to, you want to make this music with the people that make it, it to your mind in the best way. That's the way my wife always described her journey was I just wanted to play in an orchestra where people took it seriously and did their best every day. And that's how I would know I made it. But I've, like I said, I wasn't bought into that. And I saw the audition process as shaping the way I approached my training. So does the audition process shape the way conservatories approach their own curriculum and their own training? Or should we put more pressure as an industry, should we put more pressure on the conservatory um, process to uplift um, the curiosity and special characters of people? I think it definitely is both. But, but it, it, you know, for me, this idea of really being clear on your philosophy and your values is so important. I keep coming back to that because you can change you can change the dials and move the dials and have conversations and, and have a summit meeting about how to improve aud auditions so that they reflect these things. But, but if you don't ultimately change your value system to reflect why these things are important, then it won't matter. And for me, the deepest reason for changing this mm -hmm. is because I know how many musicians get into orchestras and are miserable. And they don't, and they have no agency and their voices are smothered and they're not, they don't have any creative part in the organization and they, and they feel undervalued and, and they, they feel beholden so much to other people's decision-making and these conductors are nuts. They come in and tell everybody how to play stuff. And that's just week after week like that. And, and so, so you're, you're, I'm going to connect the dots here. The audition should reflect what we're trying to provide for human beings in this role. Not just the abstract concept of the orchestral musician, but creating a life in music that's long fulfilling. Because that's what I'm interested in. How can we be an organization that the next person that gets that job has a 30, 40 year career with us where they're happy and fulfilled the entire time. They grow, they love it more and more and more. And not just because the music itself that's chosen is stuff that they like. That's not mm -hmm. the mark of it. The mark of it, the mark of allegiance to an organization is that they find that they have both, they get a ton out of the organization and they put a ton into the organization. And the audition does not provide a way to test for that. And it in fact sets you up for the exact opposite. It sets you up for that moment was when your title was conferred. And after that, you're just Lord so-and-so, Baron so-and-so, but nothing to do. You're, it's an abstract title that's conferred. 
You know what I mean? I Once do. And, and you're in a, a pure age now, you don't get to rule anything. You just you know, get the title and put that on. And, and I, okay, I know I'm being a little extreme here, but it's, but it's equal, equally the musicians that have set this up, but the managements that have not asked for a sense of community to be built where the musicians have meaningful creative existences, that, that both things are, are working against each other. To, 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 and that's why our auditions are set up the way that they are, because it's a matter of convenience and we can all stand back and say, yes, impartiality, fairness, which I, of course, believe in. Of course, believe in that. But we're often hiding behind that because it's easy to say impartiality and fairness um, while, because we don't want to tackle the bigger philosophical and, and ethical and creative questions of what we're really trying to do long term for our human beings that become members of the orchestras. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I, I sidetracked myself, that's what I was trying to get to in my question. I didn't get there, though, was that the regional quality of the orchestra, and I don't mean like Louisville's in, in Kentucky and therefore plays broadcast. I just mean that regionally Louisville is special and that someone would want to come there to get on board with that thing. And so that requires the orchestra to break out of that chicken and egg syndrome, that sort of feedback loop there between audition process, audition circuit, and the, and the um, factory uh, assembly line of conservatories that produces an endless product, the same violinist going into this sort of nondescript audition process at, where a single institution can have an intervention in that process, I think would be, that would be a game changer. I'd love to be in a position to be more vocal and, and, and clear about what it would mean to be in the Louisville Orchestra versus another job. Because every orchestra advertises the exact same way. It's all the, the, the same thing. What other industry, again, thinks like that? You know, we should be saying why we want you. We should be recruiting you because of our special approach to making music and creativity and finding the people that align with that. But I we think can't. I think the analogy, and I'm pretty sure that I talked with Donna Parks on, when she was on this podcast about the same thing, and I think I use the same analogy, that the closest thing I can think of is high-end law firms. So I, I've read some of Peter Thiel's books. I find him to be a somewhat repugnant <laughs> individual, but has some interesting thoughts on the future and the business. Um, and he, his first gig out of law school was working for some high-flying Manhattan law firm. And he described a situation where I think he lasted like six months. And everybody there also graduated from Harvard, Stanford, and Yale Law Schools and all these things. Hated every second they were in it, but the status, was, the status that was conferred in it was so high they couldn't bring themselves to leave. Now, I will say I've been almost 20 years in this industry and I, 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 I'm not characterizing anybody that I know as being chronically miserable in the business. I know that there, we all have ebbs and flows my colleagues in all the places I work on in the aggregate are giving, giving a high level of effort, but the status thing is almost separate from, it's separate from the salary in that uh, if you can get into the sort of Ixom directory, if you can get into that group of orchestras and clearly say you have made it, that thing alone is its own equilibrium and managements have the same or a part of that same equilibrium. And we have, they, they, I mean, human beings tend to jealously guard their little piece of the industry. And I feel like we are constantly in this like Mexican standoff between each other, unwilling to give up any ground on our particular um, slice of territory. But let's not dwell on auditions for too much longer. As we think about making an institution special and unique from its peers around the country, obviously some of the ways you've done that is through collaboration with local and national, international artists of different genres, but also by taking, I won't say political stances, but by in interjecting the orchestra into contemporary topics, be it climate to a certain degree, race, um, any number of issues. I wanna hear your thoughts on how, how does that go forward with large, with large legacy institutions in particular? How do they become less um, the ivory tower, the neutral zone in American life and become more a part of the texture of American civic life. Yeah. So, well, and that actually your the last two questions are connected together because you're talking about this kind of standoff. And I don't know if you meant between the, the members of the orchestra and the management, but I actually was thinking of it in terms of like all the orchestras around the country are mm -hmm. in this crazy standoff because they're, they're, they're playing this invisible game that nobody else cares about of, of status Nobody 
Nobody here in Louisville is, cares whether the New York Philharmonic's salary is higher than the, the Chicago Symphony salary and who plays anything better, as we said before. Nobody in this city cares. Mm -hmm. And my job is to serve them. I was hired to serve them, not to compete in an invisible game. And most of them are not even playing the same game at the same time anyway. So here's, the, here's what, what gets to your, your, your actual question. So what does that mean, though? Because the, in any other industry, if you're really thinking about it as, as industries, the success of the industry, would you, there would be lots of development and new organizations and new companies, and maybe they'd be bought by other companies. You'd see this dynamic, right? We don't have that at all. When's the last new orchestra that came out? The Knights, something like that, you know? And they're not, they're none of the, the recent ones are, are, are like viable long-term jobs. A far cry, maybe? But they don't, you know, they, we're not talking about things that compete with the salaries conferred by the Cincinnati Symphony. Um, so we're obviously not seeing that happen. So what exactly are these orchestras if, if they're not playing the game of actually being a part of, of an industry? They're not playing the capitalism game, that's for sure, because mm -hmm. they're, they're not new ones. Nobody's merging and they're not actually competing with each other. Mm -hmm. So here's what I decided. Uh, okay, if that's the case, let's just keep going with the logic. They are essentially functions of civic service. Mm -hmm. They're not musical entities vying for Grammys, really. What they are, they are, because you wouldn't say, well, why aren't there new cities being created? You know, they're not, shouldn't, shouldn't Louisville be trying to surpass Cincinnati and grow, grow, grow? No, they're not really thinking like that. We're thinking about being the best cities that we can be, ideally. Orchestras should do the same thing. They should see themselves as functions of the city. If they are taking on this kind of like civic element where they get the name of the city and there's not really fear that some other orchestra in Louisville mm -hmm. is going to come up and surpass us and take all our money. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. We're not going to get bought by an upstart orchestra in Louisville. So we're not part of that. We're out of that, that game right now. We are just, we're, we're sitting here in the civic game, which means that we, I, I see myself as actually a part then of this idea of public service, almost government. And that means this very important relationship between what we program, who it serves, what it's about. And that's where I think the, the, the real work of an orchestra might be in, in taking a look at your city and like a great public servant saying, okay, what in my function here as the head of the parks and rec department or the you know, sanitation services, what can I do to make this city incredible? Like how can I serve in that way? I see myself in that, that, that role. I see the orchestra in that role. What can we do musically to make this city a better place? To inform people, to, to, to offer them perspective, to bring them together, to offer healing, all the things we know that music can do, but from the vantage point as a, as a public servant, as a civil servant, I, that's how I see my role. And then that means I'm not worried about what anybody else is doing. I don't really care. I, I'm interested from a creative perspective when somebody does a, a cool thing, but it's not a rat race. It's not a competition. It's purely a matter of service. And, and that's when you start saying, okay, when the city's grappling with issues like race and climate and growth and, and uh, inequality and what it means to be you know, an active member of a creative community, when you're dealing with those issues, as a city, we need to be addressing them and incorporating them in, into our programming. But because we see ourselves as, you know, public servants, it has to be in a way that it's for everybody. I don't believe that we should have our, our concept album that tells everybody how to think, but rather offers ourselves up as the platform where these ideas are discussed, where these ideas, but, but in a musical way, I think, and that's the power of the art form, obviously, that we're not being, we don't have to be explicit about it and we shouldn't be explicit about it. We can actually talk about it and, and discuss it um, from a purely artistic, creative standpoint. Does that answer that? It does. I know I, I've seen or heard you talk about how the pandemic has focused your activities on uh, education, health and wellness and access. So do you see like in the short term for the orchestra, and I, I don't mean to put you too much on the spot. I'm just trying to get a sense of like a timeline of your vision. So I've often thought about like the operations is issue of an orchestra is that we have sort of like an orchestra like the RPO or the LO or most of the places I've worked that don't own their own hall. We're under certain constraints of the building that we have, and we have to optimize our time in that building. So if you imagine there's like a baseline capacity and demand, so that's really what operations is, is meeting capacity and demand. And we have a surplus of capacity, obviously, because we have more weeks in our season than we have weeks in our hall. So in those surplus weeks, are you matching 
these elements of health, education, and access, I mean, I know that you want to bring those into the big concert hall, but what are we going to do on the margins in the shorter term to address those things, particularly as we plan on coming back from the pandemic when we don't know what the demand for tickets is going to be? We don't, I don't think most people think it's going to snap back to 2019 levels on, on day one of total vaccination. So how do you see those, the opportunity in those marginal weeks to address these kinds of things head on? Well, and that goes so deeply to a lot of these philosophical issues that we never wanted to talk about. The fact that we have way too much supply and we keep finding what, we, what we're trying to do. It's like, we're like companies that make way too much of a product. We know that, but we don't want to admit it to ourselves. So then we try and, and remarket so much stuff to, to, to people. We're like, you know, we're, we're, we're harvesting corn. So we're, we've made corn syrup. We made corn ice cream. We've made corn cookies. <laughs> we keep trying to find new things. And, and, and you know, and that, that's, that's great from one perspective. But what, what, what we're not asking is what really fuels our ability to do what we do. It's the money that people donate and give, right? Where is the money in general in, in society right now? Where is it going? What are people's interests in, 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 in actually funding stuff? Is it pure art? No, of course it's not. It really lies in transformative concepts and ideas, generally around the ideas of, of health in a broad, very, very broad sense of health, um, education, and, and civic service. So for me, it's always been clear that that's where the funding is. How do we become part of those games? How do we get ourselves out of the idea of trying to ask people to fund the specific art that we do and start saying the art that we do has transformative capabilities in education, in health, and in building the community. So what, I'll tell you what our craziest idea was for the, for the pandemic. What I had suggested is that, and this is out, you know, outrageous, way out there, but it was, it was an idea. I had said, imagine that if our musicians, knowing that the actual ability to get together and play music is going to be quite limited. Imagine if we did two kind of quote unquote services a day of music therapeutic work. Like we were connected one-on-one -on -one with people all around the community and did 30 minute sessions with them, just playing for them and studying the long-term effects of having musical relationships, a combination of kind, I, don't, I call it music therapeutic not work, not clinical therapy, mm -hmm. not clinical music therapy, but therapeutic work because we know scientifically, this has been studied that, you know, having, uh, you know, live musical, live artistic experiences in your life is healthy. It does have positive psychological and physical benefits. So imagine if we offered that as a, as a core civic service, the same way that we think that having, you know, clean streets and great water and stuff like that is important. Imagine if we said a, a, a right in Louisville it's for people to have regular access to musicians that have made Louisville their home. Then we did the same thing with education. We said, okay, we have more time. So two services a week, we're going to spend, uh, we're saying we have a, a racial and an education uh, equality divide, right? Well, let's rectify that to the best of our ability. So let's go teach kids that have never been able to access lessons before. That's a big problem, right? I mean, the kids that, that come from a wealthy district or, or a wealthy school or have parents of means can have private lessons and they excel at their instruments and other kids only get to play during, during uh, you know, band or orchestra practice. Let's try and start solving that. Musicians are going to start teaching lessons to kids every, yeah, as part of their job. And then we'll be playing together in other capacities, but we're going to demonstrate to, to, to everybody who funds us why we're affecting the health and education and equality of our society. And now I know that that, that that gets away from the way orchestras have defined themselves, but it's the kind of definition that can make an orchestra truly viable in the future to start controlling the finances on our terms not concertizing just because it's part of a schedule that has to repeat week after week after week, but starting to say, okay, now what are the concerts we truly want to do? We're we have more financial independence because we're serving in these ways and there's long-term ba baseline funding for what that means. Now we start creating a schedule that reflects what we truly want to produce for our community. And that's, that's what I'd like to, to achieve. I've talked about this with um, other, um, some of my other interviews, but, I haven't heard it articulated quite as closely to the original concept. There's a, an idea of public value and particularly value creation in the public sector where you think about one of the prime examples, of course, is garbage collection. And so the institution obviously has amazing capacity 
to collect the garbage, right? It has the trucks. It has the guys who know how to drive the routes. They know how to pick up the things with the machines. I mean, I get up really early these days. So once a week, I actually watch like the garbage guys go around the neighborhood. And it's like, a, it's like a ballet with these guys are doing at 4.30 a.m. Uh, but the idea of public value, though, is that obviously you have the human knowledge, the physical in- infrastructure, and that leads to the this client service, right? So there is the direct outcome of picking up the trash. But that also leads to like there being no disease in the city or less disease in the city. And that that leads to a healthier population, which leads to a more vibrant economy, which leads to more access. And that constant renewal of public value and not using tradition and traditional capacity as an excuse to hide behind, but as an opportunity for reevaluation of what you do. So that leads me to a long way to my question. Let's say we did do something like with the uh, uh, music therapy um, outreach for the orchestra. It'd be hard to scale, I think, but let's say, let's say we, we, it doesn't matter. We're going to start at the beginning. How do we get the musicians out there with some kind of training? We can't send them out there completely in a learn as you, learn as you go capacity. So do we partner with teaching artists? Do we bring educators along for the ride or social workers? How does that work? We'd actually set up that whole thing so that they, you know, these concepts were ready to go, funding dependent. Uh, so we partnered with U of L. Uh, we worked with U of L's music therapy department, public health department, um, all kinds of folks that had set up a, what would be a training system. Would be a rapid training system that get would get people kind of the social training element. Not we're not talking about the music therapy that we take into people who are recovering from cancer or surgery or have HIV. That that's mm-hmm. a specific kind of thing that's that's taught you know that's a that's a clinical therapy that takes years to learn we would be talking about learning techniques for 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 providing essentially social therapy and i experimented with it myself doing these these comfort concerts which is like it's it's about just the human connection i cannot tell you how powerful these things were doing these zoom free tell me about them well i guess i can tell you yeah i mean they were it was overwhelming I mean, you'd, be, you'd see people in their homes. I thought, okay, this is, this is what it gets to. All this crap that's being put onto the internet right now, people don't realize it's nuclear waste. It doesn't go anywhere. It lives forever. Now, look, a lot of it is great. It, a, lot of it, a lot of it is great. But, but people aren't really asking themselves a lot of times, they're just, because that's the default thing. Put it on, put it on, put it on. But, but the cool thing about these comfort concerts it's the slowest way of reaching people on planet Earth one mm-hmm. at a time. Yeah. But it was taking advantage of this Zoom technology. It actually was something that I could do that's better. Never before could I have offered to play a concert for somebody while they sat on their bed, watching a family eating spaghetti in their backyard, a group of kids, you know, teenagers out in Golden Gate Park in San Francisco put the phone down in the middle and they were having a picnic. A, a, a lady living alone in the West End who, who I, I, she, her favorite song was Simple Song from Mass and I got the music and she sang along. This was a better version of things than I would ever have done before the pandemic. It was like actually taking a, a, a thing that we have now and making it into something special. And I was thinking, th- I'm modeling the idea of the therapy. This, just imagine if these relationships were semi-regular and they were with all the members of the orchestra, not just me. We'd be building serious, serious uh, long-term dynamics that would show why the orchestra is important. Now, just imagine if we studied it in addition and then could turn around to the Mellon Foundation or the Knight Foundation or the Park Foundation, a giant foundation, the Ford Foundation, and say, look, we improved mental health in this way, we improved this way, and we studied it, and here's the data. And it is amazing that this research is being done and our big institutions don't care. My friend Stanford Thompson, who started Play on Philly, which is the the Elsa Mm -hmm. Stemma thing in Philadelphia, has the data because he was smart enough to partner with Harvard in his first year of putting this thing together to actually show what his program would do. He can show that kids improve um, two full letter grades. The incarceration rate goes way down. The college acceptance rate goes way up. The, the school attendance rate goes way up. He has the data to show it. People want to fund that. That's a winning team. That's a winning idea. And, it, and it's music at its core. And, and I believe fully that, that as musical members of society, you know, that we're not, just, we're not just being paid to do our performances. We are being paid to be the Louisville Orchestra, to do something for our city. So I believe that that gives us the financial independence to do the artistic things that we truly want to do and to do them the way that we, we want to. They work hand in hand because I can guarantee 
and I've already seen it happen, that people that connect with you on a, on a Zoom music therapy basis, those people are going to be your best audiences ever. They're mm -hmm. going to show up with real skin in the game when they come to your concert. You've built an audience that way. My former, former employer, the Phoenix Symphony, has done some work and did some longitudinal studies on the impact of live music on memory patients, people with dementia and memory care. And I know that they built a lot of morale. I had Gabe Kobach on the show, the principal horn, and, and he's, well, you, you've met Gabe before. He's a Curtis guy and he's as, as bought in to classical music as anybody I know with a fervency. He loves it so much. There's no question. But I haven't really heard him talk with as much passion about anything um, as he did about that part of the Phoenix Symphony's output. And perhaps they were a few years ahead of their time. Another thing that came, up to, came to mind with Zoom, so I had another guest on, uh, Quentin Morris, who's a really interesting guy from Seattle. Do you know Quentin? I don't no. think so. You no, know, he teaches, he's a violinist, he teaches at um, Seattle University, but just like a real social entrepreneur in music. And he started a school and he's actually grew up in the Seattle area in South King County, Washington. And he described the enormous challenges of coming from a low income neighborhood and, and getting access to high quality music education. He had to make enormous sacrifice. He's like a real outlier in every way. So he started a school in South King County that was doing good work focusing on violinists and violists specifically. Zoom has been the greatest thing that ever happened to his little institution. Like his attendance rates are higher. Like he's you know, fewer missed lessons. Um, he's been able to like sit down and talk with the kids and say, you know, what do you miss about school? What do you like? What are you missing? Oh, your chemistry. Well, I teach at a major university. I'm going to bring in the professor of chemistry to talk to you guys next week. So, and he's brought in people from all across the country. So yes, it has been a liberating force. So obviously the Louisville Orchestra, well, not obviously, but the Paris Town Point was a, became this new facility where you guys were help shape in downtown Louisville that is equipped with a lot of high tech stuff, at least by our standards in classical music. And you've been able to make a lot of great productions. What of that, of that online material do you think will follow us into a post-vaccine world? So I think that, yeah, obviously the, the amount of online content that we're all producing, um, you know, it's, it's becoming de the default mode for us this year. And everyone has a, has a certain, you know, fluency with it. And, a, and um, you know, there's been a learning curve, I think, for most organizations. Very few were set up. Maybe Detroit had the setup already. Um, you know, New World obviously had the setup, but, but but I'm just saying, you know, everybody's gone through this deep learning curve, and now it's here. It never goes away. Like Zoom's not going away. Like mm -hmm. the, you know, businesses are going to use this thing all the time, and when even when they can meet in person. I think for for, for me, I've thought about this a lot because you know that it gets to the, the the core value of what is the experience um, fundamentally of 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 having the orchestra and seeing performances. Uh, because I think more than we want to admit, the social element, the communion element, the, uh, the, the, the actual kind of function of it in our lives is, is far broader than the actual moment the music starts and stops. And I know we all know this, but we haven't really thought through how valuable that is to people and financially what it means. I can tell you across the board, Obviously, there's way too much content right now. Way, way, way too much content because it's not like we're all communicating together and saying, okay, well, if Cincinnati releases on this day, then let's talk about when LA should really release and what repertoire should we all coordinate? Because we're all playing in the same space right now. You know, we're all playing in the same space and frankly, we're all competing now with people that we should not be competing with, Netflix and, and uh, Hulu and Amazon. That we're, and we've entered into their territory right now, which is dominance of entertainment on the screen. Mm -hmm. Disney, we don't really want to compete with them long term. They're, they will always win and they should win. They're better at it and we should admit that. So we should either work with them, which is really what would be the future of classical music if we actually work with these people that know how to do this stuff. But that, that's, a, that's a giant tangent. For me, what, what, what it becomes is this, this idea of, okay, we need to really have the philosophical discussions about what our experience is. Because what we've seen across the board is we've seen a lot of pity purchases Many subscribers are buying the digital stuff because they, they, they feel, oh, I can help them. Like, this is like, a, I'm giving them a tip. It's, this, this will help them. Mm -hmm. Many people are watching five minutes and then that's it. 
That's really common right now. So we need to start asking ourselves, there's, there's, you've probably seen a the theme here. We don't talk about the philosophy because we're scared of it, but we need to ask ourselves, what about the experience of going to a concert makes people happy? Why do they like doing it? What, what, really be honest and not just the stupid questionnaire that says, were the lines of the bathroom too long? Really be honest about the deep philosophy. Where, where do people find affinity and value in their relationship with our institution? How much of it had to do with dressing up or going to dinner beforehand or going with a certain friend group or discussing the music after or, you know, an awesome uh, social interaction that, that they knew would take place during it, whatever that is how much of that was connected to it. And let's, let's understand it and then use that, moneyball it. Um, here's where I do think though the technology is really important and that n none of us have done effectively. Accessibility to our music. I've, I've been thinking about this a lot. There are so many people in society that literally can't come to our concerts. Expense, transportation, health issues in any year. People that are, that, that are in, you know, recovering from surgery aren't going to concerts. If we now have the technology to deliver them concerts, it's almost a crime not to do it. It's almost discriminatory mm -hmm, not mm -hmm, to offer mm -hmm. people that had immunodeficiencies and couldn't go to group events before. It's, it's a crime not to do that now that we have that technology. But that leads to a much greater focus in terms of what we're really trying to do. And I think this is what I'm sure most organizers are asking themselves, but what is it that you're trying to do with this? For me, it's to say in the future, this connection that we have with our audiences technologically should be specifically to target people that couldn't access it before to turn it into a unique product line that gives human beings access to what we do not as some kind of replacement for it but an opportunity for them to connect with us on their terms number two i think we should also be thinking about it as a a, a holistic relationship with the institution um, well, so, so I, I'll tell you that one of my, my favorite experiences of the pandemic, I signed up for the Criterion channel online, which by the is. way, Criterion is like a very high end film company. They, they, Criterion, you know, Janus films, they take all the old films and they remaster them and okay. they put them out. So like, you know, all this stuff. And they use the same Vimeo platform that a lot of orchestras are using the, the same, it's the same actual back end technology. And I love Criterion Channel. I, I watch all these old movies and, and they always have interviews with the directors, multiple interviews with sometimes you know, film specialists and, 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 and scholars talking about it. I thought, this is really cool. This is what we should be doing long term. So these platforms that we're building should be, they should offer the accessibility element, but they should also offer the high end kind of relational element with us so that they give people this much broader window into who we are and what we do. So it solves for two problems. One is accessibility, as we talked about. Number two, though, is that between the beginning of the concert and the end of the concert, the, the musical experience is, 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 it, it doesn't have much breadth beyond that. You know what I mean? This is the opportunity to humanize the individuals in the orchestra. It's the opportunity to offer perspective on the music and really talk about it in an effective way, to give people a chance to go after they watch the concert to, to learn more about it, learn about the people involved. Um, and that's where I think you could build. So there's, there's this value of creating uh, you know, a high-end relationship with the institution and a recursive relationship. And then there's the accessibility thing of actually saying this is a right. But you have to market that effectively. This is where we should be talking to hospital networks. We should be talking to all kinds of therapy networks. We should be talking to, 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 to uh, you know, uh, community institutions, churches, all kinds of things like that that are not centrally located near us and start doing deals with them to sign tons of people up for these long term to solve for the accessibility and then start thinking about the high end element in terms of a product line. So that's probably a longer, longer answer than you want it. No, I, 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 I want to do, I want to circle a little bit back then. So how does the comfort concert idea, I know maybe obviously it's more than just you, but how does that factor in? Are you seeing the concerts or productions for hospitals as basically a comfort concert, like just scaled up? Yes, it's, it's creating specialized content for them rather than having in every hospital room or if you're in a recovery program or something like that, just the TV on HBO or, or, or NBC, this is special. This is something that the, you, the community can build programming around. So everybody's going to watch this together. This is something that's going to become a focal point of discussion and dialogue and something specially produced to make the experience of going through trauma or an, an, an inability to, to, to connect with us in person something that becomes uh, unique mm -hmm. and important. The comfort concert idea is more connected to, to two things. 
One is the genuine service element, which I, I do believe that this, this, that, that kind of service is important. But number two, it's, it's closer to the idea of a political campaign. It's, it's the idea that, you know, Joe Biden in a normal year or Barack Obama would go around meeting people and doing town halls and, and shaking hands with folks. Because if you want people on your side and to believe in your vision, that's the way to do it. You have to meet them. They have to get to know you. If we want people on our side, the, you know, the side of the orchestra, and to care about what we do, we should be meeting them and converting them one on one. People don't don't vote for you based on your objectively great political uh, you know, stance. It's not it's not pure political science. The best ideas don't win. The person that they connect with wins. And it's the same thing with what we do. People. Now, fortunately, in a pop world, they have the mechanism of mass media to carry their message a lot farther. We don't have that. We don't have the, you know, the amplification of, mm -hmm. of mass media to carry our message and to create the personality. Um, of the so we yeah. need to do it one on one. Yeah, obviously, it's, I think you have that mechanism, though, in your post. I mean, you have an empowered position where it's easier for you. I mean, the, the folk musicians or the rock musicians that are traveling from city to city, they have something of that built in and that they're maybe one of, they're the only person on stage or they're one of a handful or maybe three. There's also the merch table line, right? There's a built-in opportunity to they interact over commerce. They, yeah. Yes, they are evangelizing in addition to performing. And we should be doing the same thing. That we really should be doing this. And just think about this. Here's where it gets really crazy. Well, okay, and I learned this a lot from working with Jim James. Um, the care that goes into thinking about how and when artists like that perform is extraordinary. The way that his press team, his management team thinks about his schedule, how many times and what in each city, where, how it's marketed. They put so much care into every single show. There are weekly meetings with, if he's got a show in Philly, it's not quite selling the way. That team is meeting and talking about, okay, what's our social media strategy? What's our, and they're not even the presenters. Mm -hmm. In our world, we are, and think about this. Jim might sell a show in Philly once a year at most. We're trying to sell like 30 weeks of shows. Mm -hmm. And we don't even think like that. They put so much care and thought into the strategy of every single show, making sure that that builds the right way, that the presenters have all the tools that they need to sell that thing. They, they, if they need to get more radio time or they need more interviews with the local TV or they need a social media promotion, that's all done every single place. And it's built very, very carefully. The demographics are very carefully targeted. They know exactly the capacity of the hall. You know, we put everything in the same hall week after week after week. They think about, well, in Philly, they know that they've got 500 guaranteed. So should we put it in 400 and then oversell, you know, and do a second show? They're, they're thinking like this. And, and that's with the mechanism and the amplification of mass media. And we don't think like that. We need to think like that. And when it comes down to first and foremost, building audience person by person by person. My favorite part of the job, and I mean this, my favorite part of the job is getting off the stage and meeting with folks because my strategy is, is I look for the most person who looks the most alienated that I can find and I make a beeline for them. It's usually like someone maybe who's maybe physically somewhat incapacitated, maybe and that has ostracized them. You maze at the interesting folks. Um, but I do think that you make an interesting point that if, especially over time, that's an investment that pays dividends and you see it come back, you see it in loyalty. When you think about these as civic institutions, there becomes some civic obligation to come to the concerts, right? So that equilibrium of like, I go to hear the National Symphony because I live in Arlington, Virginia, it's kind of what I do. And that, so there isn't a lot of philosophical reflection on why we're programming and why they're coming, but I worry about disrupting that balance. And I worry a little bit about how all of us in the music business, not just classical music, but us especially, like, what is it going to be like trying to predict how that comes back? Like, I think about, I listen to a lot of business news and not a single person I listen to. They're all very smart. They've been in the business for a long time. Nobody even came close to predicting the market rebound. Like, not even, not even close. And in, in <laughs> nobody saw this coming at all. And I think the idea of prediction is like a like a 2016 business, like it died in 2016. So I'm really reticent to make predictions about people coming back to shows in the same way. But I, I, think, we are, I think we're right to be skeptical. Where is there an opportunity in that? Like, where is there, what is the opportunity to seize in that as a programmer? Well, and I, I do think 
I mean, obviously, there's going to be a moment. Well, the, 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 the challenge is that there may or may not be a specific moment soon where there's the all clear that's given. That may be the challenge here, that there's going to be an estuary of moments. Now, here's the, here's the, the, the I think it's scenario planning is important. If somebody in the middle of July officially declares, if Fauci comes on the air and says, all right, everybody's good to go now, you can all go back to concerts and sporting events, it's totally fine. There will be a huge run on, on concerts. Everything that we do, people are gonna eat it up. Of course, everybody's gonna be presenting everything they possibly can in the shortest amount of time. So I, I can't tell you, you know, quite how financially successful that's gonna be, but I can tell you that there will be huge demand. Most likely though, there's gonna be, as I said, this estuary of like some people are more comfortable now, the, the restrictions are loosened because the highest risk people have gotten the vaccine, but a lot of people haven't so far because you're trying to, you know, inoculate 3 billion people to start, you know, plus the other five, but you know, you're trying to get that first group. Anyway, that's where the, the, it's, the, the predictions are really hard to make. Um, but, I, but I do think that this has given people enough time that I, it's a little bit, I call it like the, the, the lemonade diet where they say, and I don't subscribe to this, but they say, okay, at first you're going to be really hungry just drinking lemonade and some, you know, little powder that they put in lemonade. For the first two days, you're going to be really hungry. Third day, a little less hungry. Then you're going to lose your appetite entirely. You're not going to be hungry at all. And you'll know when to eat again because at some point later on, you'll actually be genuinely hungry again. Like the first time you're just going to be hungry because you're used to eating a ton of food every day. You know, you're used to piling on two to 3,000 calories a day. Now, I'm not, I'm not advocating for this. This is a stupid diet. But I like the, I like the, the metaphor of it. Um, in the, I do think that this has been long enough that people have been able to examine the things they actually missed in life and the other things they were doing simply out of routine. And a lot of people have missed the genuine spirit and importance in their life of going to, to, to live events. So in a way, there's a natural mechanism that's, that's built in. But I, my sad kind of reality or realization is that a lot of us have not used this time to really ask the philosophical questions that I keep coming back to this whole conversation, the deeper questions of why, what, how, and, 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 and you know, the, the significance, the subtext, if you will, of what we all do here as, as artists, as musicians. We've been so quick to try and patch things up and raise a ton of money and do this and do this and fix it and, you know, oh, oh, my God. We haven't sat around and gone, okay, given this thing that's stripped away so much, can we really now ask some questions about mm -hmm. why we're here and what our role in the world is? And I will tell you that, 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 that there are two industries that do this constantly and I think are, are important for us to look at. And they are, and I alluded to it, religion and journalism. Those two industries have constantly made the case not only for the specific content of any delivery, whether it's an article in the New York Times or an individual sermon, but are making the case constantly for the importance of their entire industry. The New York Times has been very successful at not just talking about why a specific article or a specific day's paper is good, but they make the point that journalism matters. Being informed matters. The same thing that religion does it, obviously, with much more, you know, scary background of well i guess the materialism side is pretty pretty scary background too but but you know religion says it's not about this one thing was important that one day's sermon was important but overall your soul matters we they're not good we're not good with that and we, we've not taken this time to be be you know in, in, internalizing the philosophy behind why we matter we're taking this time to think about programming and, and selling shows and what we come back with. And, and if we do Mahler or two, will that be something that people get really excited about because we'll make some point about the resurrection and stuff like that. But we're not talking about why music matters as the backdrop, you know, why this matters. Because frankly, 10 years ago, when journalism moved to the internet, it, we could have lost the Times, we could have lost the Washington Post, we could have lost a lot of things. They, they have still managed to be quite successful in, the, in their own way. But they created this backdrop of, of, of getting people to understand why being informed is, is important even beyond the enjoyment you get from any given story. Why it's your civic duty to subscribe to the New York Times. We have not done that as an industry. We as a talk about it, but we don't do it. As a consumer, Teddy, during the pandemic, what has been that for you? You know, I, I mentioned the, the, the Criterion channel mm -hmm. and it's because, you know, film for me, 
I, I have been so excited about so much stuff that I've seen. It's just blowing my mind. Um, and I would never have taken the time to relate to and to really think about. Um, and it's given me, a lot of it gives me a huge pride in American culture because, you know, I think about, I think about this deeply, you know, what is it that, that what is it that this country even, you know, does that's, that's good for the world? I think about this, you know, in a certain sense, what we've been able to put out culturally, especially, you know, recently, by recently, I mean, you know, the last few decades, is, is almost like ancient Greek level of, of, of admiration and connection and, and representation. Like, I think about that a lot. And the consumption of, of culture, you know, some of it's good, some of it's, some of it's not, but the platform and the mechanism for connecting dots within our, our own society that maybe would never have been connected without that, that, that cultural competency is exceptional. Like that's what's given me pride and, and comfort in, in, in being a citizen right now. And so I've connected with that a lot and, and, and allowed myself to just be, uh, allow myself to kind of marvel at what these human beings have, have dreamed up, both in their, their creation and in their delivery. I've tried to look at that. I've tried, to, I've tried to, to marvel in the ability to go from, you know, like five or six different modes of, of cultural connection in a single day, which before I took for granted, and now I see as like a, a total lifeline because a cultural life, you know, a culture life, I don't mean that in the snotty way. I mean, a culture life as in something rich with that human communion that you get, which I think is, is you know, part of why, why we're, we're, we're alive anyway, is the greatest gift that we have to offer. You know. you, is it your feeling that the hubs of American creativity that have produced great and interesting art and like great, but I mean across the board, so music, film, theater, movies, blockbusters, art films, all of it, is that part of American life still in place? Like, is, Holly, is Hollywood still great? Is what I'm asking. In the in, in the broad sense of Hollywood, American it can be. Pop- it, it certainly can be. I mean, just like Broadway still can be great. Um, I do think that the, you know, the same thing that we're seeing uh, economically at large of, you know, a few controlling everything has happened, of course. And with so few folks controlling things, we all know they're very risk averse in a lot of ways. Strangely, you know, young, hungry pe- people that aren't beholden to anybody take all kinds of crazy risks. But that's why, you know, you have, what is it now, 15 years of Marvel movies, one after another, sequel after sequel after sequel after sequel, and every one of them made into some kind of Broadway musical because the same people are controlling so much of the entertainment world, just like, you know, it's no different than, than you know, your Amazon buying everything, everything you know, that, that it means that, that uh, our opportunity to be great becomes more of a premium um, because our opportunity to be safe is what's usually taken. And strangely enough, they end up <laughs> resembling symphony orchestras just on a giant scale because they end up taking the safe route and saying, well, we know people like this, so let's just give them more of that and spend a ton of money to do it so that they leave at least you know, impressed enough. Um, but that's, that's what they're doing. Yes, though, I still believe that we, we can be great because there is a spirit of enterprising and, uh, you know, uh, or, 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 or creative um, output that takes place in New York and LA and places like that that's kind of intoxicated. And, you know, I've been lucky enough to actually throughout the pandemic, I've had a lot of, you know, you know, crazy ideas that I've been pitching here and there and here. And some of them have started to move forward, which is really, really neat to be talking about, you know, out there VR ideas with people who actually are in the, mm-hmm. in, in the real entertainment space, not the kind of, you know, public space that we're in, but the true, you know, for-profit entertainment space and see how that works. And it is remarkable. But I think the time is now to create more of those hubs. You know, I think that if you, if you look at American cities and how they've defined themselves, you know, L.A. with film, New York with theater, Nashville with a you know, certain genre of music, um, those were shrewd and but also important decisions that were made by, by individuals to create that branding and also connected to, to parts of American history. None of that was foretold. I mean, the, the, the movement of Eastern European, you know, creatives to L.A. and New York created a lot mm-hmm. of that mm-hmm. industry. You know, it was a function of immigration. It was a function of, you know, a certain kind of mentality. And I've been asking myself, what would it take for Louisville to become a 21st century creative hub? Like, how does that happen? 
because it wasn't predicted. It wasn't like somebody, again, you talk about predictions. It wasn't like somebody in the, in the early 20th century said, and LA will become the center of film. It could just as easily have become some, you know, town in, in Montana or in France, but it became Los Angeles. Why? How? What can we learn from that? How does, how does Louisville become a creative capital? That's my, my big interest, my long-term interest. Like the one thing I really want to accomplish here. I don't know if I, if I can do it. But if well, I isn't it I, like, isn't the wrap on that idea that those agglomeration centers are really hard to replicate because people try and replicate Silicon Valley all the time, like over and over and over again. Um, but you can't seem to get that kind of vitality or Los Angeles or New York. But density is one of the, predictors of this kind of thing and just uh, and having a great unit was it patrick moynihan that said if you want a great civilization or have a great city um have a university that started 200 years ago <laughs> so you've got that so but so louisville has a lot of those central ingredients right you've got yeah. fortune 500 business you have a large university um what you don't have is a, a hub of expertise in the place and i guess if that's if you wanted to become you'd have to bring enough people there where it creates that thing where you're bigger than the sum of your parts. That that's exactly right. And I mean, I think Silicon Valley is so fascinating. You know, I grew up there and grew up in Oakland, grew up in Silicon Valley, um, sadly, but uh, you know, what's what's so fascinating is that that place, yes, the, 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 the two things that it had going for it, Stanford, but remember, I mean, Stanford was an old university. It wasn't like Stanford mm -hmm. was the tech center in the early mm -hmm. 20th century. Stanford was just a great, great school that, because of its proximity to San Francisco, you had this kind of duality of like an amazing city that everybody loves, a beautiful, a genuinely beautiful place to want to be close to, an incredible university and land. You know, mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the thing. Like there was a weird mm -hmm. lack of density next to a place of, of, of real attraction. And it means, I think it's not a coincidence that the, the cultural revolutions that were going on in San Francisco mixed with the high functioning um, you know, uh, uh, intellectual capabilities of Stanford kind of created this this weird cocktail, but, but you know, um, parthenogenesis or whatever kind of situation. Here's what I think for Louisville, though. I mean, I can't make. I don't know what Louisville could 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 be beyond music. Is what kind of my focus is. But what if this became the place, the center of of creative music making? You know, not like the country music center or the mm -hmm. you know the prog rock center, but specifically creative music making, creative you know composers. We, what if the Louisville Orchestra, with all of its history and incredible story, was like the Stanford of that, and we had just the right ingredients, and suddenly all these people started flocking here and saying, wait a minute, it makes no sense for a composer to live in a city where their local orchestra doesn't care about them at all. Mm -hmm. And that's usually the case. I don't really think that unnamed X orchestra in a big city on the East Coast really cares about the composers that happen to be living there. But what if we did? What if we became the Stanford that said, We'll give you your garage. Go tinker in there, and anything you come up with, we'll take. We'll buy that patent. We want it, and we'll do it. And we made that a part of us. Well, I think the analogy that I'm hearing, you know, certainly the history of Silicon Valley, as I know it, is yes, there was some of these raw ingredients, including cheap land. So you have a relatively inexpensive housing stock, cost of living. I may be messing this history up a little bit, but I'm pretty sure that a bunch of cast offs from Rochester, like when Rochester was the tech hub, was a tech hub, moved to Silicon Valley, like to get out underneath the nose or underneath the thumb of Xerox. So a lot of that graphic user interface stuff was Xerox employees that worked way out in the hinterlands in Northern California. So I think what I'm hearing a lot of this conversation is, is kind of getting back to like a to Tocquevillian view of a, like America, right? That's like restless, tumultuous place. And that if um, some of the cultural places have become stuck, we need to find smaller markets like ours need to find a way to attract the people that are frustrated by those places. Because if you think about like mature cities, so mature industries, like Detroit. So Detroit at one time, like in one time in America, there were car manufacturers all across the country when the business became so technically advanced, they had to centrally locate, happened to be in Detroit, the, in the car companies and they were battling and they were constantly fighting, fighting for supremacy. And then as the manufacturing became mature, it could re-disperse across the country. The reason why Silicon Valley has stayed so vital is because what they do now almost doesn't resemble at all what they did 
um, 50 years ago. Detroit's still making cars. So if we were able to create a, if these cities were able to create a culture that retained its talent, supported its talent and unstuck some of the gears, like I've been meeting on this task force, um, a state Senator here in this, in, in town, has put together this thing. And one of the things that struck me as look, I, I came into the conversation with an open mind. I, I try to, and I came to it though, with a bias for large organizations. What I, learned was like the folks that work at a really small scale are navigating in a wicked maze of state city federal grants you know uh, just an awfully gummed up system and if a city were able to make it more viable for people to do that who knows what the creative boundaries would be there wouldn't be any creative boundaries yeah that's that's absolutely right and i think a lot of that is a function of how America has gotten to a point right now when we feel like the lines have been drawn in a little bit, mm -hmm. like the, it's not as open of a playing field for the you know, the opportunity for a city to just grow. And because no one would ever say, well, maybe New Louisville could be the next New York. That sounds like a crazy person talking, <laughs> but that's exactly what we should be saying. We should stop telling ourselves that we're a great mid-sized city and that's where we like to be. We should, we should have aspirations of greatness. And we should stop assuming that all the lines have been drawn, that we're done. And yes, we don't want insanity of cookie cutter cities like China. I, I think that that's nuts. Just to, just mm -hmm. creating like 12 Shanghais is not, uh, I don't like that, like that concept of just rapidly building for the sake of building. Granted, it's a different, totally different societal structure. But yes, I'm not saying that we should just artificially, you know, and, and arbitrarily um, grow. But I do think that we should, we, we should be hungry for redefining what the what the country is sadly i i think this it goes with this make america great again concept which i think is very connected to this tv version of 50s america this um you know nbcified 50s idea of picket fences and nice structured communities and we and a lot of us have locked that in in our minds like and, and kind of the way america looked back then and the structure of it, like San Francisco was this, and New York was that, and Seattle was sort of that, and LA was that's become ossified, and and it's our it's become ingrained in our thinking. They, no one would even think to 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 take a city in Appalachia and turn it into the next hub of of you know renewable energy. They talk about it a little bit here and there, but nobody would say, well, why don't we contend with Seattle? Why don't we become the new green center of the planet? Like that just doesn't get talked about in America. Strangely, for uh, the land of opportunity, it becomes the land of opportunity, but only in the same way over and over and over. We locked it down. And that's what I'm interested in breaking because I came to a city like Louisville that I think does have a lot of the raw ingredients to take a serious step to, in, in the direction of, of smart and, and strategic growth. And yet I can see ourselves not doing it because we, we, our, our inherited definition of who we are is so strong. And I think it has a lot to do with how we etched out that map in, in that, that period, the 50s, 60s, and, and it kind of became, you know, like our, our cities all, all developed these almost um, caricature kind of definitions. And they've just been locked in and become, be, be, become more of that, you know? And instead of talking about, well, we'll bring back Detroit, we'll bring back Pittsburgh or something like that. You know, both cities have done very well recently, obviously. But let's talk about, like, totally, let's be competitive about it. Let's talk about absolutely, you know, uh, uh, redefining landscapes in this, this country, redefining the, the, what, what Kentucky can be, not in, in just accepting the fact that this is the, this is the system that we've been given. Do you ever just kind of daydream about what you might spin all this into if you ever gave up the post? It's hard to, it's hard to say. I mean, yeah, I'd want to, you know, uh, probably there's some kind of, um, you know, I hate to even say political thing because it's so ruined. Mm -hmm. I mean, that we've made it the worst job in the world to be, a, a, you know, a, a politician, partly because we've, we've made it being a politician. But I am really interested, because what I've found here in, in, in being music director of the orchestra is in telling people a big vision, even if it's way beyond your means, gets people really excited. And I do think, you know, I hate to even connect it back to this, but, but that was kind of the, 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 the magic that Trump had. And I've watched as when you describe a big idea to people that they hadn't thought of before, the magic that that has. Like when you, when you tell somebody a big idea that they never considered before, there's, that's 
a, a, a very special and important dynamic and a connection between people. And whether it's Space Force or building a wall or telling people that you're going to bring 100 composers to live in Louisville and they're all going to create public art for you every single year and it's going to belong to everyone. You're all going to have access to it. The orchestra is your best bet at changing the national perception of Kentucky. I say, let's, I'm going to own that. I say, if we go out there and do amazing work, and we turn this into the, 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 the hub of creative music making, and we go out there waving the banner of what, what Kentucky is today, we'll change that perception that people will move here and you'll get the stuff you deserve. Mm -hmm. do, you think that, do you think that the orchestra in the last seven, the Louisville Orchestra in the last seven years has changed the perception of the orchestra to the average citizen of Kentucky? So in other words, most people have a baked in idea of what the orchestra is, uh, an orchestra is. I always thought that that was fairly fixed. Like you couldn't undo that. The, all the experimentation you did, you probably wouldn't unstick that. But I actually think that's, I, my sense is that's not the case in Louisville at this point. Like after an, enough steady publicity, enough interesting media coverage that the average person knows at the very least that the, this orchestra is different than other orchestras or is different than it was before. So can the orchestra then be the driving force, the tip of the spear the way maybe a, a, a industry, is, like a, a corporation is, or maybe a university is in other places, like you really see that. Yes, if we, if we really, if, if you get people to truly buy into that mission, and that's where I, I've learned a lot and I've struggled a lot too, that you can't just be the big ideas. You have to have teams of people that truly believe in it and buy into that. And it's on the board, donor side, orchestra side, management side, all those folks have to say, yeah, we really believe in that vision. And that's work that we've been doing. But in terms of, of the, the, the state, because I, I like how you mentioned Kentucky, not just Louisville. Yes, because I think we have transformed the, 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 the definition of Louisville, although the work is far from done. Um, there are many, many, many more people that don't, don't yet have that connection. Um, but our work needs to be in bridging the urban-rural divide. I think that is the great plague in this, Mm -hmm. After, aside from COVID-19, mm -hmm. the big plague of the urban rural divide in, in this, this country, because it's not being solved by human mechanisms. It's being solved by political mechanisms and they're not solving it. Mm -hmm. I do think this, this may be altruistic or maybe quixotic and maybe, you know, naive, but I do think the, the, because music shares that weird cross, you know, uh, denominational cross section of, of America, like connection, you get your, your weird out there liberal bearded beanie wearing hipsters going to the punch brothers but it's based on the same music that came right out of appalachia you know like all those things are connected together who but who is going to institutionally do something about that like i always say music brings people together but that doesn't mean anything unless you do something with it that's that's a lot of power but if you just keep telling people and don't actually follow through then it's meaningless so what if we really did something with that and said, here's how in the next 10 years, we're going to take the orchestra and truly bridge the gap between Louisville and the rest of the state, which is significant. As you know, it's not, there's not a positive relationship between Louisville and the rest of the state. It's, it's no different than the relationship between, you know, your random person in, in Alabama and New York. It's mm -hmm. the same dynamic. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to actually try and solve for it because I think, I think, it's all based on something I read a long time ago. Uh, I mean, this is the first thing. But when I read this article about these, they did exp an experiment with people of different political uh, persuasions. And they first, they got these, they did a, a, a group where they put them together and, and just said, here, here are your topics. And they started arguing and screaming and yelling at each other. And then the second group, they made them eat a meal together and they weren't allowed to talk about politics. But after that, it's a basic thing. But this had a huge effect on me. I read this a long time ago. I thought, holy crap, music does the same thing. Imagine if these people really got together and just experienced the music first, then they can talk about anything else, but experience something that they can both be proud of, that they all exist for them. Then form the human bonds and discuss the issues and the politics and the differences after that. I think that there's a spot. I think this is a really great place to start wrapping up. But I want to expose, like, my first thought, though, about that is, of course, I'm totally bought in. I, I believe in that. I agree with you about the assessment of the divide. The high wire act, of course, is kind of like what the NFL or the NBA is dealing with, right, where this is supposed to be neutral territory sports. And when the actors or the players, and I look, I find the NBA to be an incredibly interesting league. But when they take a position, it, it, it brings the infection of politics into that neutral space. Is the way we solve for it, to use your word, to bring 
all kinds of cultural identifiers into the into the concert hall like sort of simultaneous not simultaneously but like under the same program under the same season like we're bringing hip-hop and bluegrass and gospel and r&b and uh, classical music and uh whatever your dominant refugee community is we're gonna play that all in the course of the season is it representation or is it just the act of bringing people together under the same roof it's it's both it's both because I, I do think sadly in this moment of people going through your website and looking and to see how many, you know, people are counting, how many black musicians did they, did they hire that year? I mean, it's, there people are going through your Facebook feed. Mm -hmm. Did they have a racial equity statement? You know, stuff like that. You do need to hit certain marks. That's important. Representation does matter in that, in that regard. Next is the, is the communion element. I, I believe we'll put on a big gospel show. Um, it was one of my favorite concerts we've ever done. The first half was, we had Corey Henry as mm -hmm. soloist for the first half. Then St. Stephen's uh, mm -hmm. choir, the whole thing came. We did uh, you know an hour long set with them. Then we took it to St. Stephen's the next day. The communion side of that matters even more than just representation on your season calendar. The communion side of having a lot of folks there that had no idea what the St. Stephen's church was. They're just subscribers to the orchestra. That, mm -hmm. that, that Maybe they heard of them. They knew they were good. Never seen them for sure. That communion side is extremely, mm -hmm. extremely important. But even deeper than that, there's a, there's a, there's a bigger thing. And that's that the reason you would, you would play music like that is because I know within this city, there are communities that love those different styles of music. And I believe so deeply that the orchestra is more than just a performing institution. It's a platform. And it, showing the connection between what we do on our own and the ability for us to host these musicians and do something special. And it has to be special. It cannot be just the cheapest, fastest chart that you could throw together and, and have the orchestra sitting there doing nothing. That does nothing for this. It has to be something genuine and collaborative. And when they, and people see that and their music that they've identified with and care about and mean something to them, they've listened to their whole lives is suddenly put on by their orchestra and they can see that the last stand second violinist was just as into playing that gospel song or that bluegrass tune or that you know funk tune or whatever it was they could see that they suddenly go oh that that orchestra is mine too that's the thing that it builds it builds long-term relationships and trust in a public service institution and how many opportunities do we have for that right now because you're right how many people look out the window and look at the trash collector and say wow I own, I own a part of this. This is my city. I'm so proud of that. <laughs> Nobody thinks like that. We have so few times in our lives where we have a, a moment to, to say our government, our, 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 our public services served us well. Even when they are, they're not showing it. But we have that opportunity and we should be taking it. Teddy Abrams, thank you very much for coming on the podcast. Thank you for listening. As always, the music on the program is by Craig Wagner, an amazing guitarist from Louisville, Kentucky. We'll be back soon with more interviews, so please go ahead and hit subscribe.